When you first meet Steve Mann, it seems as if you've interrupted him examining diamonds or working on a tiny computer circuit board, because the first thing you notice is the plastic frame that comes around his right ear and holds a lens over his right eye. But you soon realise that there's more to this strange gadget than meets the eye. A tiny video camera is fixed to the plastic eyepiece. Wires of many different colours wrap around the back of man's head. Red and white lights flash under his sweater. The fact is that man is wearing a computer. The main part of the computer is strapped to his body and is linked wirelessly to the eyepiece, which contains a tiny screen in front of his eye. On the screen, he can read text and view images just like on a computer screen at work or at home. Man operates the computer through a small device like a key that he holds in his hand. The computer can connect wirelessly to the internet and man can view web pages on the tiny screen. He can also check his email while he's out and about, though he sets it to reject attachments that could cause the tiny computer to crash. Man's invention comes in handy at work too. While he's giving lectures to his students at the University of Toronto, the 41-year-old engineering professor can read his notes on the little screen. Man calls his invention a digital eye. One of Man's students, James Fung, has also worn a digital eye and once, while sitting around a campfire with friends, used its wireless internet connection to find a ghost story to tell. It was a nice example of myself and the computer working together, Fung said. You could imagine that if the eyepiece were completely concealed in a pair of glasses, people would naturally think that I was able to recall the stories myself. Man builds the digital eyes himself with the help of his wife, Betty, who has worn the gadget too for nearly 15 years. Over time, he has managed to make it more and more compact. His first wearable system had to be carried in a heavy backpack. The next version wasn't much more comfortable as it consisted of a helmet with TV aerials that stuck out on top like rabbit's ears. Eventually, man developed a system that could be hidden behind sunglasses and he now uses the version that wraps around one side of his face. Man has always been interested in technology. As a teenager, he wired the family home so that he could secretly listen to his parents' conversations. He and his brother, Richard, now a computer science professor at Canada's University of Waterloo, put up sensors on the stairs that would detect when a parent was coming upstairs so that the boys could jump back into bed and close their eyes by the time their parents had opened the bedroom door. In his spare time, Man took a part-time job in a television repair shop and became fascinated by the mini-TVs that function as viewfinders and camcorders. He decided to link that technology with computing, and in the late 1970s, he began experimenting with wearable computers. Man spends hours every day viewing the world through that little monitor in front of his eye, so much so that going without the apparatus often leaves him feeling unwell, naked even. Newspapers have described him as the world's first cyborg, short for cybernetic organism. If it sounds a bit sinister, consider this. Man became a cyborg so that he could be more human. That certainly runs contrary to the image of cyborgs as electronic monsters in sci-fi movies like Terminator. But man believes that in an age of increasing surveillance through CCTV cameras, Wearing computers and cameras will give people more power to maintain their privacy and individuality, for they will have their own personal record of what actually happens to them and what is said to and by them. He is convinced that a cyborg future is inevitable. Eventually, he says, everyone will want to be more tightly linked with computers to enhance their memory and connections to other people. So, which two gadgets do you think are the most useful? That's a difficult one. I think the TV remote control is very useful. Yes, so do I. 
But is it as useful as a digital camera? Yes, digital cameras are useful, but most mobile phones include a digital camera nowadays. So in a way, you don't really need a separate camera.、Mm. If we didn't have TV remote controls, we'd have to get up and walk to the TV every time we wanted to change channels or adjust the volume. <laughs> okay, so shall we agree on the TV remote control? Yes. What about the second gadget? How about the pocket calculator? Don't you think that a watch is more useful? I look at my watch all the time. That may be true, but you can easily find out the time in all sorts of ways nowadays. On your mobile phone, for example. That's a good point, but I don't think the pocket calculator is a great invention. Really? I use one all the time. I'm no good at mental arithmetic, so I'd be lost without a calculator. Neither am I, so I agree with you there. I think we need to make a decision: calculator or watch. All right, you've persuaded me. Let's go for the calculator. So that's the calculator and the TV remote control. Yes. Let's face it, our celebrity culture is here to stay. We love reading about celebrities, finding out what they wear, what they eat, who they're seeing, and what they do all day. So perhaps the latest thing we should find out about celebrities is what charity they support. Many celebrities often use their fame to promote a variety of good causes, but lately, doing something for charity seems to have become a bit of a celebrity fashion. Many people are suspicious of celebrity involvement in good causes. They feel that it's not so much about the charity as about the huge celebrity ego that is involved. It is a very cynical viewpoint, but is it true? Let's have a look at a few famous examples and assess their impact on the charity scene. Pop star Sting, formerly lead singer of the band Police, was one of the first celebrities to get involved in good causes. As far back as the 1980s, so perhaps he can't be accused of following the most recent celebrity fashion for charity. Sting set up the Rainforest Foundation in 1989. Let's speak to one of many people who work for the foundation. Good morning, Mike. Welcome. Thank you, Mike. Why do we need the Rainforest Foundation? The foundation exists to conserve the rainforest as much as possible. And the people who live there.、Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what the foundation's work involves? Yes, the foundation's first major project was to protect the homelands of the Kayapo Indians in Brazil. They were being threatened by big businesses. Did Sting actually do anything himself? Absolutely, <laughs> Sting and the Kayapo leader Rayoni toured the world for several months.、Mm -hmm. They talked at conferences and talked to politicians. Until the homelands of the Kayapo tribe were saved. Since then, the Rainforest Foundation has got bigger and bigger, and been very successful on many more projects.、Mm, great, thank you. So perhaps we can regard Sting as one of the more genuine celebrities who really wants to make a difference. Definitely. But what about some of our younger and newer stars? What makes them get involved in good causes? Is it for real? Or is it just another publicity stunt? Chris Martin, lead singer of the hugely successful band Coldplay, has been working for quite a while with Oxfam in their Make Poverty History campaign. I ask Lisa, a member of the Coldplay fan club, what Chris has been up to. Hello, Lisa. Hi. Lisa, tell me a bit more about Chris Martin and Coldplay's charity work. Is it for real? Of course it is. Actually, the band have always given ten percent of any profits they make to charity. Really? Yes. And before the Oxfam campaign, they were already involved with Amnesty International, another cause they believe in. What has Chris done for Oxfam? Well, he visited Ghana in Africa to find out at first hand what the problems were that the local people faced. He has written articles for newspapers. And given interviews, and of course, Coldplay took part in the Live Eight concert in two thousand and five. Yes, I remember. Is Chris still involved with Oxfam? Absolutely. Thank you, Lisa. 
Another young music star who has recently got involved with Oxfam in their latest campaign is British R&B singer Jamelia. For Oxfam's Make Trade Fair, various celebrities agreed to be covered in various types of food and drink. This was to highlight the problems that farmers in developing countries have selling their produce. Jamelia was happy to be photographed being covered in chicken feathers. She is new to the charity scene, though, so it will be interesting to see how she continues in the future. She sounds serious, though. When she was asked what she thought about musicians getting involved in politics, Jamelia said, "We all have a responsibility to make a difference. We're more important to many of our fans than any global politician will ever be." She may have a point. However, Jamelia and other do-gooding celebs had better stick to their principles, or their fans will notice. They may end up in the same situation as Naomi Campbell, the supermodel who was booed by fans on her birthday, no less. What was her crime? In 1997, she had appeared in an anti-fur poster campaign for People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, and spoke out strongly against using fur in fashion. However, later on, she modelled fur coats in a Milan fashion show. She was shocked at the reception the crowd gave her, and quickly made her getaway. Perhaps that's what we, the public, need to do. Perhaps we need to make sure that all these celebrities mean what they say when they're talking about the good causes they are publicising. Otherwise, it could be just meaningless celebrity fashion, couldn't it?